Hey, if you'd like to support the production of more MOOF University video tutorials, then please visit the support MOOF section on MOOFUniversity.com. Thank you and enjoy. Previously, we've talked about triglycerides or triacylglycerols and their structures. And triglycerides, triglycerol just mean the same thing. We know that this thing has a glycerol backbone, which we can see kind of right here. It's got that glycerol backbone. And it's got these three, these three acyl portions attached via ester linkages, right? Um, those are acyl groups. So we talked about why triglycerides or triacylglycerols are important. We said primarily that they are an energy storage form. So this triglycerols are the primary way that our cells store energy. Um, and they were also important for insulation, which help keep animals warm. It's especially important for animals who um, hibernate during in, in cold environments like polar bears, for instance, I think was the example we used before. So the question is, how do we make triglycerides? How does our body's cells make them? The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start with a molecule called glycerol. 3-phosphate, and what that's going to do is that's going to give us basically our glycerol backbone. So we're starting off by making that backbone and getting it ready to go. And what we're going to then follow up by doing is we're going to make a molecule that's called its precursor. It's often referred to as its precursor, and that's going to be called phosphatidate. Phosphatidate. All right, so let's see how this works. So if we start right here at glycerol 3-phosphate, of course, it's numbered that way because we've got carbons 1, 2, and 3 here. This is basically glycerol, except at the third carbon, we've got a phosphate group. Okay. What we're going to do here is basically we're going to take an acyl-CoA, which is an activated fatty acid. We're going to add it to this glycerol phosphate, or this glycerol 3-phosphate, and we're going to get lysophosphatidate, which basically just takes the acyl group portion of this acyl-CoA and attaches it to carbon number 1. And that is done by an enzyme called an acyl transferase. Okay. And once we have that, the second step uh, to f that's going to follow up is basically we're going to take an another acyl-CoA, which could be different, and we're going to attach that at the, at the second carbon to get phosphatidate. And that's, again, it's the same exact process, and it's going to be catalyzed by an acyl transferase. And in both cases, a coenzyme A falls off. Now, a question that might come up is, how do we get this acyl-CoA? Where does it come from? This is an activated fatty acid, so it came from a fatty acid. Came from a fatty acid. So, um, how did we get this acyl-CoA? Well, if you recall from fatty acid activation, this was done by basically uh, by an enzyme called acyl-CoA synthetase. And the things that we invested that required the equivalent of two ATPs and also we have to had to add that coenzyme A. So here we're going to invest the coenzyme A. We add the ATP and off comes an AMP and two or a pyrophosphate which is eventually cleaved into two phosphate groups, but that's using the equivalent of two ATP. So that's how we get that. And that's going to give you this acyl CoA. And this acyl-CoA comes about in the same way. It just has a different R group portion, right? So we have a different fatty acid giving us this acyl-CoA. Um, and one thing to note is that this, this first um, acyl-CoA is usually, usually saturated, while this one is usually unsaturated. So uh, that's how we get phosphatidate, which is a precursor to our triglyceride that we mentioned earlier. Now, uh, before we discuss further details about how we go from phosphatidate to the actual triglyceride, what I want to ask is, where did this glycerol phosphate come from, or this glycerol 3-phosphate specifically come from? So it could have come from two places. It could have come from glycerol, which, of course, is glycerol 3-phosphate with no phosphates. It could have come from glycerol. And basically what we could have done is used an enzyme called glycerol kinase. And if you recall, kinases are 
enzymes that add phosphates to things, these, and these phosphates come from ATP or GTP. So here we invest in ATP. And it should make sense in all these cases where, we, where we're investing energy here because if this whole process is meant to store energy in the form of triglycerides, it makes sense that we're able to invest energy here, invest energy here in these steps. That, that, is, that is okay because we would store energy when we have enough of it or more than enough of it. So we could have come from glycerol, had a glycerol kinase to give glycerol 3-phosphate. Or we could have started with a different molecule. We could have started with this molecule here, which is dihydroxyacetone phosphate, abbreviated as DHAP. And you can see the difference between these two molecules is that carbon number two, carbons one and three, we've got the same exact situation going on. But a carbon two, DHAP has this little ketone whereas glycerol 3-phosphate has an alcohol. So what happens here is there was a reduction, and this is catalyzed by a dehydrogenase called glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. And if we have um, a reduction occurring, then um, we would expect to see a reducing agent, and the reducing agent here is NADH, and that's going to be oxidized to NAD+, while DHAP is reduced to glycerol 3-phosphate. Another question is, where could this dihydroxyacetone phosphate have come from? Where have we seen it before, really, is kind of the question I'm getting at. And I'll let you think about it before I actually say the answer. I'll give you like two seconds. One, two. It's from glycolysis or gluconeogenesis. So glycolysis means that this, these carbons came from glucose. And again, that should also make a little bit of sense because if we're storing energy, especially if we consume a lot of carbs and we have too much carbohydrate energy for us to use immediately and let's say we store some of it as glycogen if we still have some more left we might want to store it as fat right in these triglycerides so it would make sense that some of the carbons from this glucose would contribute to making the backbone of these triglycerides okay so hopefully that all makes sense but now the key here is that we've created phosphatidate right this is the precursor that we mentioned earlier Okay, so let's see what happens to this. Once we have that precursor, phosphatidate, this thing can actually, it's actually a, a precursor that's common to both the production of triglycerides and to glycerophospholipids. So you see her up at, up at top here, we have this glycerophospholipid. Phosphatidate is a glycerophospholipid. It's the simplest one, right? It's also called DAG3-phosphate. DAG stands for diacylglycerol two acyl groups, glycerol, and then three phosphate here. Um, so this thing can be converted into, glycerol into a glycerol phospholipid by basically just adding some alcohol to be, um, to, to sort of complete the polar head group here. So up here, this step here is the addition of a polar head group, and more details will be on that later. Um, that's not really what this video is about. We'll talk more about the glycerol phospholipid synthesis later. But what I did want to mention is that phosphatidate is a precursor that's common to both pathways to produce glycerophospholipids and to triglycerides, which we're talking about in this video. So phosphatidate, basically what we need to do is we need to get rid of this phosphate group and replace it with an acyl group, right, to give us our triglyceride. So the first thing that we actually do is that this phosphatidate will um, have to get rid of this phosphate via um, a hydrolysis reaction. So this is hydrolyzed off by water. And the enzyme that catalyzes that is a phosphatase, and it's specifically phosphatidic acid phosphatase. So um, phosphatidate is basically phosphatidic acid. The difference is that phosphatidate is when it has it's when it's deprotonated. So phosphatidic acid would have this this uh, phosphate group uh, protonated. That's the only difference. But the enzyme name still acts, or the enzyme name still should make sense acting on the conjugate base form of the molecule named phosphatidic acid. So basically, we're just cu uh, cutting off this phosphate group that's, that leaves, and we get diacylglycerol, or DAG, right? Just glycerol with two acyl groups. Once we have that, we have an activated acyl-CoA that we can just add on uh, to give us a triglyceride. And you might have guessed already um, what the name of the enzyme would be that gives us a triglyceride or catalyzes this specific reaction. It's just another acyl transferase. We're just taking this acyl group, tacking it on, giving us our product. And again, this acyl group, where did it come from? From the activation of a fatty acid.
It could potentially come from um, from fatty acid synthesis as well. Uh, but I mean, I just mentioned this here to, to discuss the idea of investing ATP as uh, potentially occurring when we're trying to store energy. So once we do that, we have our final product here. We have this uh, triglyceride. This is our final product. Now the question is how you know where where does this all happen, right? Where which organs does this occur in? And there are two. Primarily, this all this will occur in the liver. And I know that just saying that might irk some people or it might confuse some people. But um, from what I've read, most most of the time, I see that. Uh, it is mentioned that the liver is the primary location for which triglycerides and this occurs. The other place is in the adipose tissue where the triglycerides are stored. But there are some scholarly articles that I've come across that mention that adipose tissue is actually the primary location for which this process occurs. And I'm not entirely certain, but from what I can tell, most most things that I've read say the liver is the primary location where it occurs. So that might be a, you know, a situation to discuss. If you're taking a course and this is a, a gray area, definitely talk to your professor and TAs, things like that. Okay, um, See kind of what they think and how they feel about this particular question. Uh, furthermore, though, uh, the organelle in the cells where this would actually occur is the organelle that does lipid synthesis, right? Triglycerides are lipids, so the organelle that this would occur in would be the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth ER. Now, a really important question is that once these triglycerides are made, assuming especially if they're made in the liver, if that's the primary, primary location where these things are made, how do these triglycerides get from the liver to the adipose tissue? Right, Because adipose tissue is sort of where these triglycerides are primarily stored. How does it get from the liver all the way over there? Well, things get to and from organs and tissues uh, by means of the bloodstream. And there are these little proteins called lipoproteins, lipoprotein particles, that basically carry lipids from place to place in our bodies through our bloodstream. We'll talk more about that later. But hopefully that kind of wraps up triglyceride synthesis fairly well. Hope that video was helpful. Thank you for watching. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and be sure to share the video with anyone who you think might find it helpful. Thanks and happy studying.